Does the right support religious grooming? The answer might shock you. Now, my friends, many of you who have observed the political conversation for the past few years or so have noticed, or if you are astute, you have certainly noticed an uptick in the use of the word grooming, which has been used particularly in our modern context to describe um, particular kinds of ideologies that are being pushed in classrooms uh, and across society as they relate to children. Indeed, this word saw a huge uptick uh, when Ron DeSantis for forwarded the Parental Rights and Education Bill, which was erroneously termed the Don't Say Gay Bill by the media and the, and the corporate press and the establishmentarians, uh, in which he basically said in that bill that certain ideologies and concepts such as sexual orientation and gender identity are not appropriate for children under a certain grade level. And ever since then, the word grooming has also been used to describe uh, things like drag queen story hour, where there are men sometimes dressed provocatively reading stories to children, or family-friendly drag shows where there are men, in many cases, dressed provocatively, moving provocatively, and being very lewd in their behavior, performing in front of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old children. You get the drift. This word is very, very common, and it has been used to describe a certain type of behavior. Now, I'll address the merits of using the word grooming in a second, but the response to the use of this word to describe certain types of behavior has been met typically by your left-wing voices by accusing the right of turning a blind eye to what they call religious grooming. In fact, if you go on Twitter and type in the word grooming, you will see a bunch of people say that the real groomers are not the transgender or the um, drag queens who dance in front of children provocatively or the teachers who try to instill age non-appropriate concepts in the minds of children, but the real groomers are actually churches. Pastors, people, men of the cloth who actually preach and have contact with all kind of people, including children, in very personal ways. And when I, I was told uh, by someone that I myself turn a blind eye to certain types of grooming that were done in this context. Here is one video that a detractor of mine showed me to prove that the right has no problem with religious grooming. Go. <laughs> And then, of course, you see an assortment of tweets on your, on your, on your screen of people accusing pastors and, and priests and people of that sort being the prototypical, archetypal groomers. Now, a word about language, because in any political conversation, language is absolutely paramount. Political conversation these days has fallen away from the light of truth and rationality and has descended into a game of passion. These days, there are certain words and phrases that can be used in politics, in political commentary, or in legislation that have nothing to do with what they actually mean and are simply meant to provoke a reaction. In other words, there are words that are oftentimes used that are unintelligible, meaning they are not able to be rationally analyzed. For example, I have a video coming out on the phrase above the law. No one is above the law, but very few folks actually think about what that phrase means. What does it mean to be above the law and what are the implications of that for a political system founded on the idea of justice? What if laws are immoral? Are we above those laws? Things like that. But the phrase above the law provokes this visceral reaction in us Many of us that make us think, of course, no one's above the law because we are reacting to that statement out of a sense of presumed judgment and emotion. We're not critically analyzing that statement. The word groomer is cut from the same cloth, the same cloth of passion and emotion that most of our political conversation is mired in, in that it is oftentimes used by people in many cases while meaning folks who are upset about childhood innocence being transgressed by inappropriate concepts to describe that transgression, when in other cases, that there may be a different word that fits the situation better. Grooming, if we want to go back to the etymology of the word, comes from the verb groom, which comes from a Latin word. And 
the, the, verb, the verb groom basically means to condition something or to prepare something for a certain end or a certain goal or a certain state. So when you groom a dog, you're basically making sure the dog is permed and well taken care of. You're preparing them for the state of being, of being proper, of looking proper. And so in the same context, grooming would mean, would mean to condition someone, particularly a child in this case, towards a particular objective that the person doing the grooming wants them to reach. But when we call teaching gender ideology grooming, what we're doing is we are putting a massive burden of proof on ourselves that we may not be able to satisfy because grooming is not merely an action. It is an action undertaken with a particular kind of intent. And if any of us understand logic, if any of us understand reason, and if any of us understand human behavior, we understand that intent itself is incredibly hard to discern. This is one of the reasons why hate crime laws fail, because hate crime laws presume, one, that you can render a political judgment about one's in, in personal intentions and beliefs towards particular people. It's very difficult to do that in an objective way since politics is essentially uh, mired in a bunch of ulterior motives and considerations. And number two, that you can also penalize such behavior, that you can penalize such thought crimes. Both of these assumptions are erroneous and both of them really have no place in a conversation about ideas. Similarly, we have to understand that if we're going to say that someone is grooming, we must be able to prove that charge. And in many cases, to really prove that charge is incredibly difficult because you have to have access to some kind of psychic ability by which you can discern the intent of the person unless their actions are so loud to speak for themselves. A teacher teaching an inappropriate concept to a child, a subversive concept about, about gender being a choice or being a non-binary solution or being a social construct, may simply be a teacher being a misguided propagandist as opposed to a committed groomer. groomer. In either case, the teacher should not be doing what they're doing. But there's an important distinction to be made when it comes to using certain words. I personally prefer if folks use the word predatory. And in many cases, it is clear that it is predatory to have men dressed up in provocative clothing doing provocative um, dances in front of children. That is predatory because it preys, it infringes upon that child's sense of ignorance, uh, in ignorance and innocence, basically. It basically infringes upon the, the, the child's proper understanding of the world. And many of you who understand queer theory and the goals of the postmodernist, the queer theorist, the goal is basically to subvert the common social understanding of children that they are innocent and should be children of certain things and to liberate them, in air quotes, from that understanding by exposing them to particular concepts that are not age appropriate. I've done a video on this. I did an hour and 20 minute long exploration of queer theory, what it means, why it means, what it's about. And I will put that in the um, comment section down below and in the the description down below for all of you to be able to see what it is all about. Now, if we've established that the word grooming, uh, if you're going to use it as a charge, is, it has a very high burden of proof, and the word predator might actually be better to use in the cases of some conduct that are more uh, sort of explicit, we should then ask ourselves, how does what happens when one teaches a child gender ideology or one models gender ideology in front of a child by way of drag queen story hour or by way of a drag queen performance, how does that differ from religious education? Is there any distinctive difference between gender ideology and religious education? Now, let me say something that may upset people. Both gender ideology and religious education can both have significant impacts, negative impacts, on the development of children. Now, I'm personally a Christian. This does not come from animus. This comes from empirical evidence. There are a lot of people who were raised religious who ended up becoming atheists because they had a negative experience in the church or, or the way religion was taught to them was taught to them in such a way that it turned them off to the idea of God and to actually exploring their spirituality more. They associate their spirituality 
with the people who talk to them and not actually the content of the spirituality itself. It's proximity ethics. And unfortunately, the human mind, the, 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 the basic primal human mind is, 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 is wired to do this kind of stuff. And we have to correct it when it does this stuff by way of reason, or else we will be drifting down a path that will lose us, leave us lost uh, in trying to understand the world. So religious education can certainly have a negative impact on children. But unlike gender ideology, unlike the tenets of gender ideology, which teach in no uncertain terms that gender is a social construct that is entirely made by society and can therefore be redefined if one has retakes the power that was taken from them, that uh, there are such things as a non-binary uh, sort of gender, that there's such a thing as a child who has the ability to consent to such life-altering operations as to be transgender, that children are not in fact innocent, but they are in fact capable of realizing their own destinies at such a young and fragile age. All of these tenets of gender ideology, if one were to take them and look at them, it is evident that unlike religious education, gender ideology necessarily impacts the development of a child in a negative way. Well, religious, religious education can do that, but it need not do that. What do I mean? So this is where we have to get into this conversation about indoctrination. The idea of indoctrination, my friends, has been widely talked about. It was especially talked about after World War II, after the fall of the fascist regimes and the rise of the communist regimes. A lot of people in Western liberal democracies like America were very tense about what was being taught to people and how those concepts could impact their ability to understand the world. And philosophers really in the latter half of the 20th century in the 70s and 80s, they really began to nail the necessary and sufficient conditions for the word indoctrination. Now, the word indoctrination, if you look at the etymology, simply means to teach. It comes from the Latin word docere, which means to teach, and doctrina, whatever is taught. So literally, it means to teach whatever is taught. Now, having said that, the connotation has been that it is to teach someone, instruct someone in such a way that it limits their ability to see the world fully and restricts them to this totalizing, simplified view of the world. That is indoctrination. In fact, the philosopher Robert J. Lefton called the necessary condition to say something as indoctrination to, to it to teach a totalistic ideology, which is basically, and I quote from an essay here on indoctrination, an extreme ideology that has a detrimental impact on a person's cognitive, affective, and behavioral development. Cognitively, a totalistic ideology severely limits one's intellectual horizon by constricting the person to a simplistic and binary we versus you worldview. Effectively, such an ideology incites an all or nothing emotional alignment through intense affection and loyalty for one's leaders and fellow group members and a corresponding hostility and hatred towards those outside the group. Indoctrination is best seen and defined if it is in teaching and instilling a totalistic ideology as defined here into the hearts and minds of the indoctrinated. Communism, the Marxist worldview, which is built on dialectical materialism, which is built on a kind of determinism that, that completely erases human liberty from the equation, which ignores the individual and absorbs him into this class-like organism, which is abstract and doesn't exist. It is a totalistic ideology because it, it has a single linear view of the world. It, has, it lacks a complex understanding of human behavior and human action. It has no good understanding of human nature, and it therefore instills all these things into one single line of thought. Now, are there variations of Marxism within that line of thought? Yes, but it's, but it's akin to having a bunch of prisoners in a jail cell. There are a lot of prisoners in that jail cell, but they're all still in a jail cell and they're restricted by that. That's what Marxism is. It is a totalistic ideology. Similarly, religion can be taught in this way, but it need not be. You can instill religious values into a child that are also applicable in a secular sense while not completely consuming them with a totalistic understanding of religion. Whereas gender ideology itself, watch this, is necessarily a totalistic ideology because it presumes certain things about the world that are totalizing and simplistic. 
Gender ideology, the idea that kids can become the opposite sex, the idea that there are, there are more than two genders, the idea that gender is not tied to biological sex, the idea that children can consent to certain things that are inappropriate for their age, the idea that children have their right mind in order to consent to these things and agree to these things, all of these are tenets of gender ideology. All of those things presume multiple ideas. Number one, it presumes that objective truth does not exist. If you do not believe that there's a core link between gender and sex, then where is your understanding of reality? You have no understanding of reality because reality tells us, by way of reason that we can observe it, that these two things have a very close relationship and there's all kind of science and biology to satisfy these things. Number two, that all meaning in the world is socially constructed and therefore meaning, ideas, truth can all be changed if one has power, because the set, third premise is that social constructs are a result of power imbalances. They are a result of certain people who have particular ideas having power and then over a course of time imposing those ideas onto society through power, which is why all of these liberation movements talk about reclaiming certain words and reclaiming certain things, because it's not about those things having meaning. It's about you having power and then making the meaning what you want it to be. It is a subjectivist worldview. All of these premises can only make sense if you do not have a foundational view of reality. That is, that reality is knowable and it is resolute and it is concrete and it is not amendable according to our desires and whims. If you reject that, you reject the fundamental building blocks of society. You reject the fundamental building blocks of human nature by which we understand man and we evaluate man. And you reject any yardstick that I or you can use to operate in the world in an efficient and coherent manner. Gender ideology presupposes this. So whereas you can have a kid raised in the church who is not enamored in this totalistic ideology, you cannot have a kid who has this other stuff, this subversive postmodern bile, modern in front of them, not be enamored in this totalistic ideology, which collectivizes them into a group and then instills them with a set of basic precepts, which give them a very simplified and impoverished view of the world and human nature. So yes, it is possible for churches to affect the development of children nat uh, negatively. But this is not necessarily so. Just like it's possible for someone to run a car off a road and get into a car crash. But if one has the right idea about how to use a car, they can get from point A to point B safely. If one has the right idea about how to understand religion and God and spirituality and philosophy, they can get from point A to point B safely. But no matter what kind of idea you have about gender ideology, it is rotten to the core, it is epistemically dead, it rejects reality, and it presents you an alternative, illusory view of reality, which puts you into the trap of a totalistic ideology. So, does the right support religious grooming? Well, by necessity, gender ideology requires grooming. Religion only incidentally involves grooming. I'll let you decide which one you would rather take a bet on. But also, that question is a little silly. Because once again, there are so many different facets and variations to the right. There is no one single chord that everyone on the right speaks to. There are paleoconservatives, neoconservatives, libertarians, classical liberals, progressives, populists. There are all kind of people on the right, many very varying different shades, who may have all have different opinions, but who all may come together on one issue. And that's the important thing. In our age of emotional political dialogue, it is crucial that none of us lose sight of the complexity of these issues, of the importance of using philosophy and moral reasoning to reach the proper conclusions, and of the importance of recognizing and being charitable to your opponents, even if you completely disagree with them. That is the only way we will be able to have productive conversations about this issue and any other issue that is happening. So, as I said, my friends, in any case, grooming in all contexts should be opposed. But making, the, making religion the enemy is a mere straw man to distract from the very serious harm these anti-ideas, these very 
bad childhood innocence harming ideas are having on the potential development of children everywhere. My friends, I love you guys so much. If you love me, subscribe to this channel, like this video, share this video, comment on this video. I love you guys so much and please stay pensive. Bye guys.